So you're an attorney and you've decided to go out on your own. Now what? You need a plan and you're not alone. Join expert host Adriana Linares and her distinguished guests on New Solo. Tune in to the lively conversation as they share insights and information about how to successfully run your law firm here on Legal Talk Network. Hello and welcome to another episode of New Solo on Legal Talk Network. I'm your host, Adriana Linares. I'm a legal technology trainer and consultant. I love helping lawyers and law firms use technology better. Before we get started, I want to make sure and thank our sponsors today. Ross Intelligence is the legal research platform that leverages AI to get to the heart of legal issues fast. Go to rossintelligence.com for a 14-day free trial. We'd like to thank Alert Communications for sponsoring this episode. If you're a law firm looking for call, intake, or retainer services that are available 24-7, 365, give them a call at 866-827-5568. Law Clerk is where attorneys go to hire freelance lawyers. Visit lawclerk.legal to learn how to increase your productivity and your profits by working with talented freelance lawyers. I definitely want to make sure and thank our sponsor, Clio, today because Jack Newton is one of my special guests. Clio's cloud-based practice management software makes it easy to manage your law firm from intake to invoice. Try it for free at clio.com, and that's C-L-I-O dot com. All right, listeners of New Solo, we have a really special episode today. I'm absolutely delighted that Legal Talk Network has arranged for me to have a chat with two goats, if you will, Jack Newton from Clio and Seth Godin, a well-known marketing guru and expert. I thought I would start by giving Jack the floor for just a minute and saying some things about Seth because, Jack, I'm sure that when you invited Seth to be the keynote speaker at Clio, and he said, yes, you were thrilled. And then I'm sure you had a lot of lawyers that said, never heard of him. Who is that guy? And then he came on and, you know, gave his talk. And, you know, I'd like to hear from you. I'd like you to give a little introduction and then sort of tell us the feedback that you got from lawyers about the teachings that Seth gave them. Yeah, absolutely. I've been a long time admirer and follower of Seth, and he's influenced me and the way I market and talk about and position Clio in the marketplace since we started back in in 2008. Uh, and I, I think, you know, simply put, Seth's one of the best thinkers on marketing on the planet. And we invited him to ClioCon to follow what I think is a pretty time honored tradition at ClioCon, which is to bring speakers from outside the legal sphere to lawyers and present them with some ideas that will really change the way our attendees think about the world. So, you know, what, one great example of that prior to, to Seth joining, for example, was, was Gary Vaynerchuk, who we had speak at a ClioCon a, a few years ago. I, I, I don't think any lawyer in the room knew who right. Gary V was when he <laughs> got on stage, but everyone left that session a, a raving fan. And I, I think exactly the same thing happened at the virtual ClioCon this year with 4,000 attendees around the world attending Seth's virtual session. And I, again, I, I think what, what Seth does such a great job of is challenging the way that people think about marketing, the way they think about positioning their products uh, and their services and their solutions in a marketplace. And uh, I, I think lawyers, as, as professionals, are people that really need to start thinking more innovatively about marketing, about how they position themselves in the marketplace. And that's that's more true today than it's ever been. And uh, I really think Seth gave a, a powerful perspective on how to think about things differently. One of the one of the statements Seth made, I think, that resonated most strongly with our audience at ClioCon was people don't wake up in the morning with a billable hour problem. They don't Mm -hmm. wake up thinking I need to buy a billable hour and that's going to solve my problem. People (laughs) wake up with real problems that need solving. And, you know, lawyers would do themselves a great service doing a better job of positioning themselves to properly solve those problems and really build empathy to the challenges their, their clients are navigating. So to me, it was such a a well-positioned and timely talk at, at ClioCon. And I'm looking forward to hearing what else Seth will be sharing with us today? 
That's great. Well, Seth, I hope you enjoyed the, those raving words from Jack. That was so, nice. um, Seth, I'm going to ask everyone to just Google you if they don't know who you are instead of spending time asking you to tell us about your 19 books and all your successes. So I, what I really want to do is dive in and, and inspire our listeners to be better business owners and be happier humans. I know everyone talks about you from this perspective of being a marketing guru and changing how we look at advertising and marketing. But in all your teachings for me, what I really get from it is uh, you're a happiness coach to me. And I think a lot of that, you know, stems from building a business or being part of a business that makes you happy and you're surrounded by people who are happy to work with you and around you. I'd like to start by asking you to define for my listeners your idea of the difference between a freelancer and an entrepreneur. Because I know that a lot of lawyers will launch a business and their families and their friends will say, wow, you're an entrepreneur. That's so great. But you define those two roles very differently. And I, I want my listeners to start thinking about the difference between what you're about to tell us and how to move from one to the other. Because for many of them, that is their ultimate goal. They're a great place to start. And the words matter. In a minute, we'll talk about marketing. But for the mm -hmm. difference between entrepreneurs and freelancers, I'm currently a freelancer. What it means to be a freelancer, it's not disrespectful. A freelancer gets paid when they work. They are the person who does the work. If you read my words, I wrote them. The work of a freelancer, if you want to move up, there's only one way. It's not by working more hours. It is not by hiring little versions of you that you can substitute in without the client knowing. It is about getting better clients. Whereas entrepreneurs, if they're doing their job, should not do the work. They should hire people to do the work. And the legal profession has been organized against entrepreneurs. But if an entrepreneur is running a law firm, that law firm, that lawyer should never go to court. That is not their job. Their job is to build something bigger than themselves that makes money when they sleep. That every time a, a managing partner is in court, that managing partner is not doing her real job, which is hiring the next generation of people getting the next cycle of clients. That is what entrepreneurs do. Figure out how to build it so that you're not the one who is doing the work. If you want to be a freelancer, be a freelancer. Own it. Be proud of it. Don't hire junior versions of you. Get better clients instead. And make more money. I think one of the things I read about you is raise your rates. You know, get pa get paid more. And I think this is something that a lot of lawyers, especially the lawyers that I deal with, they, they don't know what they're worth. They don't know how to value their time. They spend too much time studying things like the Clio Legal Trends Report and figuring out where to, where to base their billable hour, where when I wish what they would do is be more creative about how they're delivering legal services and, and, and making their customers happy, their clients happy. They don't like, here are, th here are four words lawyers don't like to hear. Customers, marketing, training, and technology. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. And Are that's you... what we're here to talk about. Oh my God. So, so let's talk about marketing for a second because okay. marketing, you, you were, used the word advertising when I don't have anything to do with advertising. Advertising was all there was to marketing in 1966. And people should be forgiven for thinking that marketing is about hype and scamming people and running clever ads and jingles and the law firm in Buffalo with the fancy 800 number. But in fact... That's advertising. Marketing is everything you do that engages with your clients or anything else in the market. And we were talking earlier, you know, Han Solo was a second rate character in a movie. He wasn't the star of the movie, but everyone knows who Han Solo was. Everyone. Why is that? Because he wasn't an easily replaceable commodity. Harrison Ford was peculiar, idiosyncratic, specific, somebody who we needed. And when they needed to make the next movie, they needed him and they couldn't get someone other than him. And so what it means to be a new solo is to say, what work can I do with my specialty, with my focus, with the people I connect, with the way that I lead that makes me the one and only worth it? As opposed to saying, my slogan is, If you are looking for someone, I'm someone, because that's not a slogan that's going to get you very far in the age of Google. It's true. Well, as one of my favorite internet legal marketers likes to say, Jason Marsh says, uh, you don't want to be a lawyer, you want to be the lawyer. 
So mm -hmm. what I want to, let me double back just a little bit. And then I do want to come back and dive in about marketing because what I want to ask you to help us do, and Jack, this is where you're going to come in, hopefully with a good story, is a lot of attorneys who are launching a firm, leaving their big firm. So I call, we call those big law refugees to start a solo practice. Or right now there are so many young attorneys that are trying to start their practice. They're going to ramp up they're going to get excited. They're going to hopefully get the right infrastructure. They're going to try to do all the right things. They're going to hit a dip. They are indeed. Tell us about the dip, one of your books, and how lawyers you know, can get out of that and stick with it to survive. I used to live in the NYU law school dorm. I published three books about law firms. I was married to a lawyer for many years. I'm still married. She's just not a lawyer anymore. So I have a lot of firsthand experience mm -hmm. with this. Let's begin with this. When you hire a big law firm, you're doing more than hiring a lawyer. You're hiring a big law firm. And if you leave a big law firm where you got billed out at $600 an hour, you don't get to just say, now I'm a solo practitioner and I'm worth at least 500 because you're not a big law firm anymore. And what people were buying from the big law firm are things you don't have. That's good news and bad news. It's bad news because you're not just a small version of a big law firm. It's good news because it means you can do something else. And what you can do is find a different kind of client that wants a different kind of engagement to help them go forward. And the story you tell and the story you live is critical. So the dip usually hits when you leave a big law firm after the thrill of not having to kiss up to the senior partner <laughs> goes away, but right when the reality of how hard it is to get good clients kicks in. And so in that moment, most solo practitioners make a mistake. And the mistake they make is moving down in the market to say, I'm going to stop looking for good clients and I'm going to start taking easy clients. And easy clients are a problem because easy clients prevent you from getting good clients. Yes, you can probably get some guy off for DWI. But the thing is that if I'm a good client, I don't want to hire a lawyer who just got somebody off for DWI. I'm looking for something else. And the dip is that spot you have to make your way through to get to the other side. You don't get to the other side by holding your breath. You don't get to your other side by pretending to be a big law firm. You get to the other side by becoming a leader in your field. And you do that by organizing organizing the people who need to be connected, particularly in this moment when your colleagues are freaking out, holed up in their offices, no idea how to meet, the, the Lions Club isn't meeting, the country club is closed. <laughs> and in that moment, if you can be the organizer, if you can connect 10 entrepreneurs who need to be connected, if you can connect 10 plaintiffs that need to be connected, you will become the one and only one. Hey, let's take a quick break. We'll be right back. We're going to hear some messages from our sponsors. The legal industry is undergoing a fundamental transformation, and the Daily Matters podcast is here to give you a competitive edge. In Daily Matters, Clio CEO Jack Newton interviews prominent legal experts to explore how solo and small firm lawyers can succeed in the current economic environment. To listen, visit clio.com forward slash daily or subscribe to Daily Matters wherever you get your podcasts. Artificial intelligence won't outpace lawyers anytime soon, but lawyers who use AI are already outpacing lawyers who do not. With Ross Intelligence, lawyers conducting legal research leverage AI to get to the heart of legal issues fast. Ask a question on the Ross Legal Research platform and Ross will return on point case law. Go to rossintelligence.com today and get a 14-day free trial. Use promo code LEGALTALK for 10% off. All right, we're back. We're going to keep our conversation going with Seth Godin and Jack Newton. Jack, you must hear a lot of stories from lawyers who think about quitting or changing the direction and just, you know, hit that dip. And I'm sure you've got some stories about some who have, have done that but gotten out successfully. Tell us some. Yeah, I, I think that it is a challenge a lot of lawyers face that is really around the, the entrepreneurial aspect of being a, a lawyer and succeeding as a as a solo or, or maybe striking out and, and starting a small firm with a colleague from a, a big law firm. What I'm always surprised by is how many big firm lawyers 
secretly harbor this wish that they can leave behind this big firm environment and strike out on their on their own. And and many of them, you know, harbored is a almost a lifelong dream sometimes to yeah. the to the grave. And and the ones that do strike out in, in, invariably, I find, wish that they'd done it earlier. It's you know, and they, sure. they and it's making that leap. And I've heard that story so many times, uh, hundreds of times at this point that it, it, I, I don't even want to highlight a specific example. It's just yeah. a theme I see so many times. And I, I think the reality is that the world has changed in a way that actually enables entrepreneurship in a way that it didn't even even a decade ago, but certainly more than 20 or 30 years ago uh, with technology that's around today. One of the yeah. reasons you used to have to stay at a big firm was to have the technology infrastructure, right. the business infrastructure, the people infrastructure, just to run your your legal matters efficiently. And, and all of that is now off the shelf. It's available in the cloud. You go and spend 50 or $100 a month on yep. a technology stack, and you've got your, your law firm's problems covered. So I, I think what's really amazing is just with the right mindset and a handful of tools, you know, a lot of lawyers can can go and tackle that challenge, but it's it's got to be with a more holistic view of how to run a law practice. It is not just hanging a shingle and expecting that people will knock down your your door asking you for for business. And I think one of the most powerful concepts for for any entrepreneur is is to figure out what are they going to be wonderful at? What are they going to be the world's best at? Mm-hmm. And I, I I think this is a uh, uh, something I'd love to to hear Seth speak about just in in that theme as well is you know I, I think many lawyers when they do decide to to leave the big firm hang a shingle go out on their own they're left with that question of how do I stand out from the fray and it, as you were just speaking about the solution isn't to try to be everything to everyone it's not to be the the best general practitioner on the the planet it's it's to be really great at something specific. And I, I I think that's maybe the the challenge for many people and where they get stuck is maybe figuring out, you know, what what are they actually best at and what truly fulfills them when they when they do it. And then how do you double down on that and actually start building gravity around that in the in the marketplace? And yeah, I would love to hear you speak to that, Seth, because it feels like where most people get stuck. Well, the first thing is you didn't shine quite enough light on what Clio does. But from my understanding, it makes life a lot easier for the solo practitioner to not worry about that. Because let's be clear, having lived with hundreds of people in the NYU law dorm, they wanted to be cogs in a giant machine. They signed up to give up three years of their life to qualify, to go on that thing at Cravath or wherever, so that someone else would take care of all of these things and they could just put in the hours and grind it out. And one day you wake up and you realize that's no life and that there is no later, there is only now. And so I'm thrilled when an organization like Clio shows up and offers infrastructure and moral support to help say, well, you know what? You don't have to do all of the stuff. You can get to do the hard stuff, but what's the hard stuff? My grandfather was the Dean of Bankruptcy Lawyers in New York City and had a fine practice with not that many people. He was the first president of Polaroid. Uh, Edwin Land offered him stock in exchange for incorporating the company. He took $75 instead. Leaving that aside, (laughs) the way he built his practice was he was the advisor and general counsel to the Paint Association. And all the Sherwin-Williams and Pittsburgh Paints and everyone else, they would have meetings. And Yezo would show up and for free, just like hang out with the paint people. Fulfillment doesn't mean that you were born to be a trademark lawyer or that you were born to do commercial work for people who make paint. Fulfillment comes from the style of interactions you are having with people. That what it means to be fulfilled, whether you're a doctor or a lawyer or a candle maker, is are you proud of the work you did? Not can you tell me the specifics of your client? People who go into the music business and end up working in the mailroom of the music labels aren't in the music business. They're in the mailroom <laughs> business. And the same thing is true when you choose to be a lawyer. So if I was starting today as a new solo, I would do something like realize that there are a 1,000 to 10,000 companies that have been wronged by Google's monopolistic antitrust practices. Start a newsletter, put on Substack if you want, analyzing one after another this 
theory of the case. You will find that your idea spreads. Your phone will ring because you will, within weeks, become the world expert on this topic, right? Or discover that there are 50 up-and-coming entrepreneurs in your community, many of them women, people of color, people who have traditionally not been embraced by the power system. Organize them. Figure out how to have four Zoom calls a week in which six to 10 of them come to check in with each other. The very fact that you're the organizer of that call will give you joy and will give you business. You're not there to pitch business. You're there to help people surface their problems. And then on their own, they're gonna say, well, who's the best lawyer I know? Oh, this person, they're in the room with me. And this is not the same as saying, we're one of the five biggest law firms in America. You have a law firm problem, you should hire us. They're totally different ways of being in the world. I'm gonna jump in and step back and comment on a couple of things Jack said and then ask uh, Seth another question, which is Jack, you know, I get those emails. I, I always joke around that when I get, walk into a law firm or, you know, lawyers hear about me or listen to the podcast, I become the bartender and or the hairdresser for them. <laughs> and they pull me aside and they're like, hey, I'm thinking about going out on my own. I just got one yesterday where this attorney from a big firm says, I've, I've, I've been listening to your podcast and thinking about going out on my own. So yes, that I think is a secret dream for many of them, but they're so afraid because they're so risk averse. I can tell you, and I, I'm telling them, um, not the two of you, this, I have personally yet to meet a lawyer who has done that and has failed. You today have all the resources to build a successful practice. If you want to be a solo that just works from home and, and services corporate clients, you can. The information's out there. So that's the first thing. The second thing is I want to remind everyone that it does not cost today what it cost 12 years ago to launch a law firm. So 12 years ago, when a lawyer called me and said, I want to leave my firm, what's it going to cost me? I'd say, oh, well, you're going to need $8,000 for the server. It's going to have to have exchange on it. You're going to need a network. You, you know, it was terrible to have to say to a solo, you need eight to $10,000. Today, you can start, how do I know? Thanks to Clio and many of its partners and all the other technology that's out there. $500, if you have $500 a month, for a budget, for the infrastructure for your firm, you have more than enough. That's a lot of budget room I've given you with $500. So the technology is out there, the information is out there, the clients are out there. What you've gotta do is figure out what you wanna do that's gonna make you happy, which is where I, where I wanna turn the conversation back to both of you, which is niches, okay? I tell lawyers all the time, you can't be a PI lawyer, pick a niche. Because everyone's a PI lawyer, everyone's a family law lawyer. So I love hearing stories. As a matter of fact, I have a YouTube channel station on Latera TV where my focus is one thing. I interview lawyers that have weird and wonderful law practices. I had the elder fraud fighter, military defender, cruise ship lawyer. Uh, they, they're amazing. And I'll tell you this, and this is where I want you to jump in, Seth, is they are so much happier. Yep. Then the lawyers I talk to who are not passionate about what they do, who, who are just cogs in a wheel, when your heart is in it, especially as a lawyer because it's such a stressful job, life is different. Yep, for sure. So the hardest part is selling lawyers who have been indoctrinated since they got their first A when they were seven years old into deciding to be happy instead of deciding to win a game somebody set up that you can't be happy at. That game... The game of what was your score on your LSATs, where did you go to law school, and how big is your firm? If you want to play that game, you should turn off this podcast right now. Thank you. That yes. If you want to play a different game, which is, I did work for people I care about, and I'm proud of how it came out, and those interactions are the key, and I'm not going to be embarrassed at the fact that I am a cruise ship lawyer, because so what? Why is that worse than being somebody who got Monsanto out of trouble. It's right. not worse, right? And so where we begin is understanding that good clients have some things in common. Here's what they have in common. Number one, they have money to spend to solve their problem. It's possible, hopeful, that you will do enough pro bono work for people who don't have money. But let's begin with this, that if you need to pay the bills, Clients with money to spend to solve their problem, all other things equal, are better than clients who don't have money to solve their problem. Number two, 
you would prefer to have clients whose lifetime value is higher, not lower. Meaning that a client who has an urgent problem that can be solved in five minutes and you will never see them again is not as good as a client that is going to need your help for years to come because it costs just as much to get either one, right? And the third thing that makes a client a good client is they tell their colleagues that good clients demand better work from you. And in exchange, good clients spread the word. You don't want clients who demand anonymity. So what we end up with is a whole list of industries where we can show up because those clients are all there just waiting. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I'm in seven of those industries. And when someone says, oh, you have a contract with AOL? I know the person who's done 19 different deals with AOL. Well, who else would I hire? You're the (laughs) AOL lawyer, right? And how much does it cost? Well, you can charge me by the hour, but that would be stupid for both of us. Why don't you just charge me based on it working? Because you'll make more money and I'll sleep better at night. Jack, surely a lot of your clients and customers are in niche practices. And do you, do you get that same vibe from them that when it's something, you know, if you're a musician and you're practicing some sort of music law, you're, you're passionate about what you're behind? Absolutely. And I, I think it, it just speaks to a really basic human need, which is, I think, you know, the desire to be really great at something. And I think all of us would re- rather be really great at a specific thing than mediocre at a lot of things. And unfortunately, a lot of law practices are structur- structurally set up to be the latter, you know, and they're trying to yeah. be the, the lawyer that can solve every problem for whoever happens to walk in the door. And I, I think one of the more powerful concepts I've come across in in business is just this concept of the the flywheel, the the concept that Jim Collins talked about in Good to Great, and and this idea that you can power the flywheel in a variety of ways in different businesses. And I think for legal businesses, that flywheel is exactly what what Seth just characterized, which is customers coming back time after time, you delivering a truly great experience that differentiates yourself from. Your, your competitors and leaves an impression on them that leaves them then going out, referring their friends and colleagues to you. In the internet age, of course, this is leaving a five-star review for you on Google My Business. This is leaving a positive review for you on, on Avvo or Yelp. And that's the kind of thing that really accelerates the law firm flywheel. And I think at the heart of that is figuring out how to be really wonderful at the specific thing you're doing the particular kind of problem you're solving and the experience that you you surround that in. And I, I think you you really only can achieve that when you are focused. It's very hard to do that in a highly generic way. But that that flywheel, when it starts humming, is pretty unstoppable. Seth, one of the things I heard you say in an interview, and I can't remember if it was with Jack or something else, was you should be spending a big part of your day referring potential clients and customers to someone else who's the right, better fit. And I think this is something that when a lawyer is starting out their practice and they hear that, they just die. They go, no way, I'm getting business in the door. I'm not gonna refer it out right away. But I think to encourage them to believe that that's the right thing to do if you're gonna pick a niche and focus on it is key. Right, so I don't know how much of your day you need to spend doing it. What I was saying is if you're not doing it, then you're lying when you say you want to be a specific. If you want to be a specific, then it means that anyone who asks you to be a general or anyone who asks you a question that someone could answer better than you, you eagerly mm. send them to someone else without some backroom deal where you're going to get paid. Yeah. Why? Because you've just earned trust. And trust is what they've got in bu- in bushels at Cravath, right? That's all they've got. And you don't have any. And you're going to earn trust with potential clients, with industries, and with your peers by saying, no, I, yeah, I could do that for you, but this person does it better than me. And if you're not willing to say that, then let's be clear, you've already announced to yourself that you think you can outwit your clients. You can't. Your clients are smarter than you, and they're going to figure out that your willingness to take on any deal means that you don't really care about your specific promise. You know, I have to say from a personal perspective, 
in the past year, I've really gotten to doing that because I got really stressed out. You know, lawyer dealing with lawyers is really stressful. And I would take on projects that, yeah, I could do. And yeah, the, the payoff was going to be really good. But I'll tell you, I am so much happier and more empowered when I say, I don't want that big chunk of money because my mental health is, is better. It's a very hard thing to do, especially when you're a solo practitioner that really doesn't make that much money, but you make enough to be happy. But to do that, I can tell you guys, my listeners, as someone who has lived that, it's a game changer for your for everything in life. And it's important to grasp that concept and then just try it once. You'll feel better. Yeah. And it be, beyond being a symptom. So again, never having practiced law, my career was over shortly after my first New York Times bestseller because I was just burnt out and I hadn't written any, hadn't written anything for 10 months. And an unknown writer named Malcolm Gladwell sent me a book that he had written called The Tipping Point and asked me for a blurb. And the thing about authors is we blurb each other's books all the time. Sure. Tim Cook doesn't blurb a Samsung phone, right? Because the mindset of most industries is hoarding, but authors encourage each other. Well, after I read his book, I realized in the back of my head, I'd been thinking of a book all along. And I wrote a book in the next two weeks. I wrote the entire book in two weeks called Unleashing the Idea Virus. And I reached back out to Malcolm after I'd blurbed his book. And I said, Malcolm, you clearly inspired this. I won't publish it if you think it's too close to your book. And he wrote the foreword for it. <laughs> awesome. And yeah. that's why my career came back because I got unburned out. And Malcolm has benefited. I have benefited. The world did not get smaller because both of us are in it. It got bigger. And if you think about how you can become an indispensable center to any community of lawyers or non-lawyers, it will always pay off. There's not a scarcity problem here. We are living in a world of abundant problems. Mm -hmm. And if you're a problem solver, you're not going to have to worry about being busy. I just want to tell my listeners to, you mentioned your book, um, Unleashing the Idea Virus. And I think there's a lot of similarity, or I have them kind of in the same column in my mind as tribes, which is finding people who have something in common. And what I want to say to lawyers is create a movement and it doesn't have to be around the law that you're practicing. Just create a movement, create a community, get that that buzz going about you and what you're doing, especially if it's something you're passionate about and the word will get out about your law practice. And I think that's just something that, you know, they have a hard time. Lawyers are notoriously risk averse, which, you know, they all say, I hate change. I hate when people say I hate change. I love change. I, I live for change. So as a change agent with these lawyers, having to tell them that they're going to have to change the way they're practicing or what the te technology tools that they're using are, it, it's hard for them. Also encouraging them to sort of find ways to create. Oh, the other thing is not only are they risk averse, they're not very creative. Sorry, sorry for my creatives that are out there. I know they're there too. So I really want them to think about the opportunities that the internet offers and being able to create that community and that buzz. So now let's flip back to really, you know, what everybody wants to hear from you, Seth, is marketing. So you said something really interesting in another interview, and I loved it. You said, you know, part of marketing is everything that touches the client, not necessarily ads and advertisements and banners. And one of the things you said, which resonated with me, because I'm not a lawyer either. I'm a technologist. I work with technology. Lawyers practice law. I practice technology. And I, you know, we work together. One of the things you said was make it easy to work with your clients. So don't send them a PDF when you can send them, well, you said Google Doc, but in my mind, I was like, word. You know, when you said making it easy to communicate and work with your clients is part of your marketing campaign and your marketing plan. And I cannot tell you, I wanted to hug you when I heard you say that, because this is one of the things that lawyers hold to their chest is, is, is their, their product. And they want to make it harder, whether they know it or not for not only their clients, but you know, even in the case of an opposing counsel, I, I look at my boyfriend sometimes, I'm like, why did they send that to you in a PDF? We're going to convert it to a Word document anyway. Why make you go through the hassle? Yeah. I'm working with another lawyer starting just a couple of days ago, and I'm stunned at the lack of oh. technological innovation, um, sophistication. So Have for call example- me. I'll, I'll make your life easier, Seth. <laughs> um, putting the contents of the note in the subject line of the email, or not using a 
secure shared doc to have me upload my social security number and everything else. Nice. But going back, I mean, it probably will work, but it's nothing that makes me feel confident and comfortable. And it's not remarkable. You have a huge opportunity right now to say whatever field you choose to be in, that part of what you stand for is that this is gratifyingly fast, easy, secure, and will make you feel smart. And so, you know, one of the things that I could easily see uh, a lawyer doing is coming up with a practice where they represent both sides in a deal and using shared docs, forms, making it really easy for people to lay out what's important to them and being the person who crafts with both sides the deal that they can then take back to their lawyers for approval if they want. But the thing is technology, the network effect, this ratchet of things moving forward because we do them together, this is happening to the law whether you want it or not. And you have so little to lose compared to Jones Day in this shift because Jones Day would have to you know, spend $5 million on the IT the first day. Oh yeah, for sure. You can just weave together some tools in a week and suddenly you're running circles around the big guys. It's absolutely true. Nobody can probably attest to that more than Jack Newton having built Clio with an open API and realizing that that we need this platform or a platform like Clio that allows you to build a customizable tech stack. One of the ideas that, that Seth was just talking about is, is this idea that the way you deliver your services is, is actually, I think, one of the most easy ways you can differentiate yourselves in 100%. yourself in the legal industry. And if you think about it, you've already worked so hard through law school. You've gotten into the you've you've excelled at the LSAT. You've gotten into law school in the first place. You've worked your whole life, like Seth said, you know, maybe to be this, do a tour of duty of as as a cog in this brutal machine for a little while. You've done the hard work and now you you've struck out on your own and you're trying to find a way of differentiating yourself in the marketplace. You know how to do this incredibly hard thing that a vanishingly small portion of the human population knows how to do. And and yet you let the easy things go to the wayside. Right. You, you, you let the client experience the way you're interacting with the client. The simple thing, like, are you sending a, a PDF or are you sending an editable Google Doc? Are you collaborating through email or are you doing it through a secure client portal? Are you making people go to their desktop to answer your questions? Or are you providing a, a slick mobile interface for them to go through their onboarding process? And and just flip Seth's experience on, on its head and think, you know, what if this lawyer was somebody who really understood technology and their mm. intake process was a secure online Q&A and a, a chat bot that Seth could just securely interact with to answer all of their questions. If all of their subsequent interactions happened in an online portal, Seth would probably be going to every single one of his friends saying, I've got this great lawyer for this specific kind of problem. And and, and maybe that's a, you know, to, to Seth's comment around niches, maybe this is the best lawyer in the world for book contracts. And he's worked with Seth now on 19 book contracts for his various bestsellers and has an amazing tech platform to support all of that. That is a lawyer that will never not be busy. Right. They will be turning away clients because they're so busy. And, and to me, it's that, that small incremental effort that can go into really making your client experience sing all the way from their first touch point interacting with your, your website all the way through to can you give me a review on Google at the, the right. end of the process. Every single one of those touch points can be one where you're you know, to, to use Seth's framing, marketing yourself, but just positioning right. yourself as somebody who really understands your client and, and is empathetic to their needs and speaking to them in a way that minimizes friction for, for them. And it's just such an easy way for more lawyers to differentiate themselves and stand out in the marketplace. A couple of times you mentioned uh, Google reviews. In This Is Marketing, I talk about affiliation and status and dominance. Many people make their decisions each day based on affiliation. So everyone wears the same clothes to the interview. Uh, we pay attention to who's sitting around the table at the gala. These are affiliation decisions. But humans also pay attention to status and dominance. Who's up and who's down? Can I get into that fancy restaurant? Who is beating up who kind of thing? And so, you know, Perry Mason uh, had an affiliation relationship with Della and Paul, but 
he had a dominance relationship and that he never lost a case, right? And one of the things that's available to a lawyer who is specializing is claiming status. And that means you don't have any Google reviews. It means you have an unlisted phone number. It means that the only way to get in the door is to be referred by somebody who's part of your inner circle. Mm -hmm. Because only a really, really good lawyer could get away with that. And that's part of the story. That one of the seductions of Google is the mass market. How will I reach everyone? Mm. And that's why we get all uptight if we get one one star Yelp review, one one star, right? But the great restaurants on Yelp celebrate their one star reviews. Oh, you gave us one star because we're a steakhouse and you're a vegetarian? Please <laughs> never come back. Right. Because yeah. that makes people who want a steakhouse more likely to come. And so I think part of what you need to do as a new soloist is to learn a lesson from Han Solo, which is own it. Don't be a wounded animal. Own who you are proudly and be that. Because we look for status from our lawyers, not just affiliation. That's such a great idea, doing that whole secret door to my law firm angle. I would love to see a lawyer try to pull that off. I'm pretty sure everyone who just heard you, Seth, had a heart, another heart attack. It's the second heart attack we've given them in this in this turn. Well, if, what's the, if what they're doing is working, they yeah, should keep doing it. But my guess is they're <laughs> listening to this because it's not. But I, I, I think it's a super great point, Seth. And I, I think you see it in other, other industries. One, uh, one example would be in the venture capital industry. One of the top handful of firms in the world is Benchmark. Go to their website. Their website is literally Benchmark in all caps. And that is the full website. There's nothing more. There's nothing about the partners. There's nothing about why you should choose them as an investor. But their word of mouth is probably the strongest word of mouth any VC on the planet has. And, and it's a great example of, I think, a, a very deliberate strategy that can work, but you need to be opinionated about it to make it work. Yep. We're going to take a quick break, hear some messages from some sponsors, and be right back. As the largest legal-only call center in the U.S., Alert Communications helps law firms and legal marketing agencies with new client intake. Alert captures and responds to all leads 24-7, 365 as an extension of your firm in both English and Spanish. Alert uses proven intake methods, customizing responses as needed, which earns the trust of clients and improves client retention. To find out how Alert can help your law office, call 866-827-5568 or visit alertcommunications.com forward slash LTN. Law Clerk is where attorneys go to hire freelance lawyers. Whether you need a research memo or a complicated appellate brief, our network of freelance lawyers have every level of experience and expertise. Signing up is free and there are no monthly fees. Only pay the flat fee price you set. Use rebate code NEWSOLO to get a $100 Amazon gift card when you complete your next project. Learn more at lawclerk.legal. And we're back. We're going to continue our conversation with Seth Godin and Jack Newton. We only have a few minutes left, and I do want to ask for another um, couple of ideas, ways to inspire my listeners, which is free prize inside. Most lawyers don't think about a lanyap. In New Orleans, the word lanyap is very popular. It means a little something extra. You know, lawyers are, for the most part, first of all, they're not trained how to run a business. They're not trained how to run a law firm. They're just trained how to study, analyze, apply law, solve a problem. So when it comes to marketing and differentiating themselves, they don't know how. They can't think outside the box. But I love the idea of lanyap. And mm -hmm. I'd like you to speak to that just for a few minutes, Seth. And, and then, Jack, if you have some ideas or if you've heard some stories from attorneys who have done something like Free Prize Inside that has helped them differentiate themselves, I'd love to hear that. So I got a thanks American Thanksgiving card in the mail a couple of days ago from somebody. And if you read the fine print at the back of the card, it was clear that they had just uploaded their entire address book to a website that mailed out all these cards. This is not a free prize. No. Uh, it is not a free prize. <laughs> for a lawyer to say, uh, you're a great client, don't pay me for the last two hours, thanks very much. Not a free prize. A free prize is something that matches the magic that you are able to contribute. It is not a gimme. So what, why are you a lawyer in the first place? You're a lawyer because you're really smart and you're good with concepts and good with words. And so, yes, thank you for doing the contract. Yes, thank you for winning the case. But now, 
you're going to talk to me for an hour and a half about the strategy that I'm approaching the world with, and you're not going to charge me for it because it's not legal advice. It's just a smart colleague sitting next to me because we are aligned. That's a free prize, right? That what we are talking about here is not a hustle. No one wants to be hustled. No. We are not talking about this whole idea of how do I grab some attention from someone who doesn't care? Right? Like if you were my lawyer four years ago on a matter and you call me now, I don't really want to hear from you because we don't have a relationship other than the fact that you said you'd give me some of your time to work on this problem. But because we never built another bridge, Mm -hmm. because it was even Steven at the end of the deal, even Steven means we are apart. Nobody has a happy relationship with the person who has the mortgage on their house because every month you pay the money, now we're even Steven. What we're looking for here is to create uneven. What we're looking for here is to create actual bridges that aren't part of a hustle, but you're doing them because you can, because you see something, because you can say something, because you've earned my trust. And to do that and not charge me because it's not legal work is appropriate. I don't want free legal work from you, but I want to be seen by you. Yeah, I think, you know, agree with everything Seth said. And one of the more influential takes I've seen on this, this free prize inside kind of concept is from Chris Dixon in the effortless experience. And he he talks about the fact that if you look at the the kind of response curve of clients of any kind or just consumers of any kind, the ones that see the, the loyalty and customer satisfaction that is created once you've met expectations really plateaus pretty quickly. And going into exceeding expectations is actually a, a game of diminishing returns. So whether that's the card in the mail or some other surprise and delight thing at the end of an engagement, while that might feel good for everyone for a microsecond, it turns out that clients pretty rapidly forget about it and don't actually put a lot of value in it. And then when you shift that question and say, what do they actually value? They they actually put a lot of value in exactly what Seth is describing, which is make my overall interaction with you more valuable and, and make it more effortless as well. The little touch points that that Seth's talking about, like rather than sending me this hard to fill out questionnaire in some format that I need to load up on my desktop PC, make it effortless for me. That is actually the thing that that consumers massively value in today's marketplace. And the place you should be investing that that incremental effort is is, I think, not in the surprise and delight over exceed expectations, but actually do the meeting expectations as clearly as possible and as effortless as possible. And, and the old, the old adage maybe of under promise and over deliver is, is actually maybe entirely wrong. Maybe, maybe it's promise exactly what you're going to do, deliver exactly what you said you're going to do, but make that as effortless as possible throughout the entire process is I actually, what I believe is the winning formula. Well, and this is where I'm going to make my usual pitch for technology where technology can if you're using it right, which isn't hard these days because it's easy to use, it's affordable, it's easy to learn. When you empower your practice with technology, not only are you creating that effortless experience, not only are you creating those free prizes along the way, you are reducing your own stress. You are making it easier for you and your staff and everyone else to see the life cycle of a matter. To pay, You don't wake up in the middle of the night going, oh my God, did we remember to file that thing? You know that you did because a, a box was checked off. So for me, everything, unfortunately, comes down to technology and using it right and not hating it. And don't hire an attorney who said, oh, I'm a dinosaur. I got a secretary that does that. And I think my point is reduce stress, use it right, make your life easier. I don't think technology makes a lawyer a better lawyer. I think technology helps a lawyer be less stressed out and have a better relationship with clients. Correct. Well, you guys, this has been a really great conversation. I very much appreciate the time from both of you. My, my two, two of my heroes, my goats out there in the world. <laughs> Jack, what you have done for the legal community with Clio and the inspiration that you have given even your competitors to build great products for lawyers has certainly made my little life easier, but I know it has improved really the lives of, of many, many, many lawyers out there and their staff and their, you know, and everyone that lives with lawyers. So oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for that, Jack. It, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. And Seth, this has really been a thrill for me. I'm 
I'm a fangirl like everybody else. And I, I read your, your books and your blog every day. And I hope every lawyer who hasn't heard about you and doesn't know who you are <laughs> goes right now and Googles and just absorbs some of these great ideas that you have shared with us and with, with the world. So thank you very much too. Oh, it's a privilege. Thank you both. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Seth. All right, everyone. Well, unfortunately, we've reached the end of our time together, and it's a bummer because what a great conversation we're having. I want to make sure and thank Seth and Jack so much for taking the time to talk to us today. Make sure if you have appreciated what you've heard today and on past episodes for New Solo, please give us a five-star rating, subscribe, and please share this wonderful podcast. And I say that not because I think it's wonderful, but because of the feedback that I get from you, my listeners, please share it with any other attorneys and colleagues that you think would find New Solo helpful. I'll be back next month with another episode. And until then, don't forget, you're not alone. You're a New Solo. Thanks for listening to New Solo with host Adriana Linares. Tune in again to learn more about how to successfully run your new practice. Solo, here on Legal Talk Network. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.